In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Good evening. I want to thank Pastor Jeff for inviting me to speak this evening on verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 130. Verse 5 reads, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Our theme during Lent this year is compassion. Last week, Pastor Jeff invited me to send him a video recording of my message for this evening. I agreed because we now need to maintain social, social distance to fight a new virus for which we have no immunity or vaccine. As some of you may know, my wife and I belong to a vulnerable population. Consequently, we both need to reduce our risk of exposure to this virus because of our age. Moreover, my wife has an underlying medical condition because she was hospitalized for 10 days with double pneumonia 15 months ago. At our first Lenten service in March, I said that the word compassion comes from a Latin word that means to suffer with. The Latin root of this word is pati, which means to suffer. In our Christian tradition, the word passion in, refers to the suffering and death of Christ by crucifixion. Compassion literally means to suffer together or to suffer with. Showing compassion to others enables us to relieve suffering, especially during this time of crisis. I am speaking, of course, about the public health and economic challenges we now face on both a national and global scale due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We show compassion when we are willing to help either a friend or a stranger in need. Compassion motivates us to be thoughtful and kind when we are with other people. Giving of our time and talents to a church or charitable organization takes compassion too, as does volunteering to help the growing number of people who are now sick or hospitalized due to this pandemic. The good news is that we are beginning to see ordinary citizens working diligently to suppress the spread of this disease. Last Saturday, the Honolulu Star Advertiser reported how scores of volunteers are making face masks in their homes and offices for people in need of protective gear. As Christians, Many of us want to be compassionate during this crisis, but the desire to be compassionate may not be true for society as a whole, especially during a pandemic. David Brooks, a columnist for the New York Times, recently wrote that the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 brought up the best and the worst in human behavior. In fact, self-centeredness has been growing in our society for several years, according to Jean Twenge, a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. She published a book titled The Narcissism Epidemic with her co-author, Keith Campbell, in 2009. In preparing my message for this evening, I found several studies of compassion that I would like to share with you. The first one is by Dr. Emma Sapala, the director of Stanford University's Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. In chapter six of her book, The Happiness Track, she explains why compassion serves you better than focusing on yourself. She begins with the observation that we learn from an early age that only the fit will survive. We see ample evidence of that philosophy in our daily news. 
every day, we learn that hundreds of people, many of them old and with underlying health conditions, are dying from this new virus. Because we have no vaccine and the world's population has no immunity. Survival of the fittest may explain who lives and who survives this new disease. This same philosophy has influenced the thinking of social scientists too. Economists often assume that rational be people act or behave out of self-interest because the world's resources are limited. Thus, to survive in this world, we are told to think about oneself first, rather than the needs of others. We only have to look at empty shelves in food stores and the lack of ventilators and other medical equipment and staff to see examples of limited resources. Because the supply of ventilators is severely limited, state governors have been forced by our national government in Washington to bid against each other for the ventilators they need. Our national government appears to have a laissez-faire philosophy when it comes to allocating ventilators to where they are most needed. The phrase <clears throat> survival of the fittest is usually attributed to Charles Darwin. He was a naturalist, a geologist, and biologist who wrote about the science of evolution in his book on the origin of species in 1859. But Darwin did not coin that phrase. It was coined by a political scientist, Herbert Spencer. He proposed the idea to justify social and economic hierarchies in the world. In fact, Darwin argued, and I quote, communities which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic members would flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. Darwin said that compassion and kindness are the actual reasons for our survival over the centuries. In other words, our survival as a society or even as a congregation of believers here in Honolulu depends on helping each other successfully navigate the health and economic challenges we now face. Recent studies of compassion show the fallacy and even the danger of focusing on oneself too much. Excessive focus on oneself harms you in four ways. It creates blind spots. It can ruin relationships with others. It can make you weak in the face of failure. And it can even damage your health. These studies also show that people who make compassion, not self-interest, a priority in their lives are more likely to be happier and more successful. In fact, some studies show that compassion improves your health by strengthening your immune system. How can it do that? Compassion normally normalizes your blood pressure, lowers levels of stress, helps overcome depression, improves your physical recovery from illness, and even extends your lifespan. Besides social distancing and good hygiene, we know that a strong immune system will help to protect you from this new virus and will help you to recover if you catch it. Well, how can we strengthen our immune system? To answer this question, let's look at the work of James House. He's a professor emeritus of social psychology at the University of Michigan. He did a landmark study that looked at connections between health and living alone. 
His studies show that social isolation seems to accelerate the aging process. Now we all know the basic principles of good health, such as eat more veggies and get more exercise and get more sleep and rest. But we often overlook the need to connect with other people. The opposite of social connection is loneliness. Loneliness has been linked to greater risk of disease, physiological aging, and even premature mortality. In fact, loneliness has been linked to increased inflammation in the cells of our bodies and a weaker response by the immune system to infection from disease. Do you see the irony? To suppress the spread of this new virus, we need to self-isolate and maintain social distance. But we also need to stay connected to keep our immune system strong. Fortunately, many people are now using both old technology like landline telephones and new technology like smartphones and the internet to stay in touch with each other. Dr. Breen Brown, a professor of social work at the University of Houston, has written about the value of social connections. In an interview, she said, and I quote, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irresistible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love and to be loved and belong. She says, when those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break, we fall apart, we become numb, we ache, we hurt others, we get sick. In 2013, Michael Poulin and his colleagues studied over 800 people who engaged in volunteer work. They published their study in the American Journal of Public Health. They found that high levels of stress generally predicted earlier mortality, except, and this is the important part, in individuals who engaged in volunteer work. Likewise, a long-term study of elderly couples compared people who spent time caring for others with those who had others care for them. As a general rule, caring for others not only improved overall health, but it also in increased a person's lifespan. Clearly, all of these scientific studies show that compassion has clear benefits for our health and emotional well-being. In other words, extending compassion to other people is in your self-interest. But these same studies also show that the benefits of compassion depend on what motivates acts of compassion. Yes. People who volunteer live longer than their peers who do not volunteer, but only if their reasons for volunteering are altruistic rather than self-serving. In other words, exercising compassion and helping others must come from genuine desire and not be an act of self-interest. Stay well, be kind to each other, and thank you for listening.